Fuit honus is a deo, cui nomen erat Ioannis. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Although there were a great number of uh, sources used in preparing this sermon, uh, far too many to cite, the bulk of the credit is due to the brilliant work of Don and Moksar. As the past few decades have made clear to anyone with eyes to see, there's been an alarming Islamic expansion into Europe. Last month in Budapest, on the feast of St. Stephen of Hungary, there they celebrate his feast day on August 20th, there was a mass and procession. In his sermon, which was broadcast on state radio on the state television network, Bishop of Gyor spoke of the current situation and asked his faithful, why do the Muslims come to Europe? And why can they take over Europe? Why do they now do what they could not do 500 years ago? Why? Because the Catholic people have lost their faith. How can we defend Europe without the faith? It was not always this way. On August 6, 1682, the Ottoman Empire declared war on the Holy Roman Empire. Kara Mustafa, the Grand Vizier of the Turks, bragged that after the fall of Vienna, he would stable his horses in St. Peter's Basilica. Sultan Mehmed IV sent notice of his decision to Leopold I, the Holy Roman Emperor. Quote, We will destroy your little country with our army. Above all, we order you to await us in your residence city of Vienna so we can decapitate you. We will exterminate you and all your followers. Children and grown-ups will be exposed to the most atrocious tortures before being put to end in the most vicious way imaginable. Your little empire I will take from you and its entire population I will sweep off the earth. Close quote. The sultan followed with another cheery note in February of 1683, reading in part, quote, For I declare unto you, I will make myself your master, pursue you from east to west, and trample under feet with my horses all that is acceptable and pleasant in your eyes. For I have resolved to ruin both you and your people, and to leave in the empire a commemoration of my most dreadful sword. It will be a pleasure to me to publicly establish my religion and to pursue your crucified God, whose wrath I fear not, nor do I fear his coming to your assistance to deliver you out of my hands. I will, according to my pleasure, put your sacred priest to the plow and do some things to your Catholic women, which I will not repeat here. Forsake your religion, or else I will give order to consume you with fire. Close quote. Sultan Mehmed IV, 20 February 1683. In the face of the Muslim peril, Emperor Leopold turned for counsel to the apostolic nuncio and papal legate, a Capuchin priest and a miracle worker named Blessed Marco d'Avignon. Blessed Marco told the emperor, quote, God is armed with scourges because he has been provoked by our sins. We should appease him by humiliations, repentance, and self-denial. Then, when our hearts have turned back to God, and when in reparation for the public offenses that are committed against him, we shall have rendered to him the public homage which is due, I am certain that God, though he send affliction, will not will our desolation. Close quote. Then Blessed Marco turned to the Viennese and warned them, quote, Vienna, Vienna, your love of lax living has prepared for you a grave and imminent chastisement. Convert and consider well what you are doing, O wretched Vienna. Close quote. The emperor heeded the warnings, commanded public penances, and the Viennese responded with penance, 
prayer and public devotions to Our Lady, help of Christians. From Rome, Blessed Pope Innocent XI called on all Catholic rulers to unite against the Turk and began sending out papal nuncios throughout Europe to promote the Catholic cause and join the Holy Roman Emperor in the war effort. He spent Lent in prayer and penance for the cause and ordered that the votive prayer against the infidels be said at every Mass. King Louis XIV, for his part, worked very hard to undermine the papal efforts. Louis XIV, the very same king who refused to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart in spite of the specific request delivered to him by St. Margaret Mary from our Lord, Louis XIV declined to obey the Pope and, in fact, had already assured the Turks of his neutrality in the case of war. Jan Sobieski, the King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania, was prepared to answer the Pope's call, but in order to go to war, Polish law required him to get a unanimous approval of the Polish Diet, the Polish legislature. The French ambassador used all the slippery diplomacy possible to induce the members to vote against the war. And only at the last minute, after the Turks were already on the march, did Diet finally support the Pope's request. Meanwhile, the Turks had begun to move. In May of 1683, they paused to wait reinforcements in Belgrade. Estimates of the total number of men in the Turkish forces range from 160,000 to 300,000. That's the, only the number of soldiers. It doesn't include the enormous supply train for the army and all the men associated with that. On July 14th, they began pulling up before the walls of Vienna, pausing briefly to completely massacre the 4,000 inhabitants of a town six miles away. As the Turks neared the city, Louis XIV took advantage of this dire situation to attack the Netherlands, which at that time were part of the Holy Roman Empire. It was this kind of behavior that earned him the contemporary title of, quote, the most Christian Turk, the most Christian ravager of Christendom, the most Christian barbarian who had perpetrated on Christians outrages of which his infidel allies would have been ashamed, close quote. In the meanwhile, Emperor Leopold had retreated from Vienna, taking 8,000 of the residents to Linz, leaving only 5,000 citizens and a garrison of 11,000 soldiers. The city's defenses were still incomplete as the Turks began to leisurely surround the city and set up camp. The traditional arrow, bearing a message demanding surrender and conversion to Islam, was shot into the city, but the defenders didn't bother to reply, so the siege began. The Turks shot poisoned arrows at the defenders and trained what cannon they had at the walls, but the artillery was inadequate for the task. So on the 20th of July, the Turks began mining under the walls, filling the tunnels with gunpowder and setting off the charges. The Viennese, who by this time were suffering from severe dysentery, managed to bar the resulting gaps and keep the Turks out, but it was only a question of time until the Turks succeeded in completely breaching the walls. Outside the walls, life for the besiegers was pleasant and comfortable. Kara Mustafa's immense tents had gardens with fountains, baths with, bathrooms with scented baths and soaps, sumptuous beds, rich carpets, and a menagerie including rabbits, birds, and even an ostrich. It also included his harem and scores of black eunuchs to keep them in order. Back in Poland, Jan Sobieski was gathering his troops. Before leaving his kingdom, Sobieski wrote to the Calvinist leader of Hungary, who had aligned himself with the sultan, and informed the Hungarian leader that if he tried to take advantage of the situation and burnt so much as one straw, either in the territories of his allies or anywhere in the territories of the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that he, Jan Sobieski, would go and burn him and all his family in his house. The warning was sufficient to keep his unguarded kingdom safe in his absence. On the Feast of the Assumption, August 15, 1683, Jan Sobieski, at the head of some 2,000 winged hussars and leading some 23,000 other troops, began the forced marches to Vienna from the shrine of Our Lady of Shestoa. At that time, the Polish-Lithuanian winged hussars were the most elite cavalrymen in the world. They were called wing because they wore wings. They were attached to their backs. They're made out of wood frame, and they had eagle feathers attached to them. 
The wings gave a fearful appearance and made a frightening sound, both of which terrified the enemy and spooked their horses as the winged hussars descended upon them. Besides that, over their armor, they wore the skin of a leopard, a tiger, a wolf, or other animal over one shoulder, which had also spooked the enemy horses and the men. They carried a 17 to 20 foot long hollowed out lance. It was designed to shatter on impact with anything solid. Attached to the tip of the lance was a long pennant. Besides the lance, they carried two kinds of swords, one under each leg, one for piercing and one for chopping, a war hammer and a pair of pistols that were holstered over the horse withers. Their mounts, which are a remarkable Polish breed of cavalry horse, were capable of traveling 70 miles a day over a period of several days. And this is with guys bearing arms and in armor. If you're a horseman, you know how remarkable that is. Typically in battle, the hussars were used as shock troops, so they were held back until a decisive moment was at hand. When they were called up, they customarily sang a Polish hymn to the Mother of God, the most ancient national hymn in the world, national anthem in the world, the Bogorodzica. Here's an English translation of it. Mother of God, virgin by God, glorified Mary. From thy son, the Lord, chosen Mary, obtained for us, sent to us, Kyrie eleison. For the sake of thy Baptist, O Son of God, hear the voices, fulfill man's thoughts. Hear the prayer which we offer. Deign to give us what we ask for. On earth, a stay with God. After a life, a sojourn in paradise. Kyrie eleison. So they'd be singing the hymn and line themselves up knee to knee at about 100 yards from the enemy and begin their charge, moving on to flat-out gallop at about 50 or 60 yards with their lances lowered alongside their horses' heads. The whole effect of this line of winged warriors singing this hymn, then descending upon the enemy at full tilt, all these six- to eight-foot-long pennants swirling, uh, fluttering, flapping in the breeze at the end of those 20-foot lances, all these leopard wolfskins uh, flapping around, the whole effect is absolutely terrifying. So, 